Good evening, everybody. We're glad to have you. Hopefully, you guys uh, can listen to this recording and uh, glean something from it. So, we are in 1 Kings. And, uh, Jay, are we able to throw the outline up there? So, we're in 1 Kings. We are in the second part. Divided Kingdom, 12 through 21. And we stopped at... Uh, Ahab last week and we're finishing Ahab and Elijah and the battle at Mount Carmel because it's so important. There's so much in it that we couldn't just skim over it. So Ahab is the king of Israel and if you read chapter 16, he's a pretty nasty king. He had wooden images. He provoked the Lord to anger, uh, the balls, the asterisks. He just did it all. He was a nasty guy. So Elijah shows up in chapter 17, and that's where we're going to start. Um, so chapter 17, just Elijah pops out of nowhere. Don't really know where he comes from. He's here. And Elijah, the Tishbite uh, of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to, his, came to him saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook, um, hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. Cherith. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Cherith, I believe is how it's supposed to be pronounced. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook. Um, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. From, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith. Is it Cherith or Cherith? I thought it was Cherith when I looked it up. Um, but I'm going to say Cherith because it's easier. <laughs> Which flows into the Jordan. So this brook flows into the Jordan. Um, Elijah is fed by ravens. Um, we don't really know where it is, but it's believed that it's in the Wadi Kilt, correct? Is that correct, Jay? On the, the, the brook that he hid, the brook that he hid in and was fed by the ravens, um, is it concrete that it's that this is the location? Because when I was talking to my dad, he said it, a lot of people think it's the Wadi Kilt. Don't really know? Okay. Did you have some pictures of the Wadi Kilt up there? Yep. Okay, so it starts... Does it start in Jericho? It goes, yeah, goes right to it. it is, I'm assuming it flows. Oh no, it flow. It would flow to, to Jerusalem. Okay, okay. So so it would flow from Jerusalem to Jericho. Okay, so that is where most people understand it to be. I could be wrong. There's a picture of it. There's some houses built into it. Um, rugged terrain, easy to hide in. I would think that it'd be hard, hard to find somebody in that kind of a scenario. So he says, go hide. The ravens are going to feed you. Um, and the ravens brought him bread and meat. <laughs> it wasn't just feeding. It was bread and meat. Now, I wonder where that bread and meat came from. Um, as my dad and I were talking about this, we were like, wouldn't it be interesting if... Um, King Ahab had a servant set a table for him, and while he was tearing to get his food, <laughs> the ravens came in there, got his food, and took it to Elijah. So uh, these ravens show up with bread and meat. I don't know if I would want to eat meat from a raven, but if you're hungry, hey, and the Lord sent them, maybe they washed their beaks before they um, went in there. Uh, so the ravens brought him bread and meat, evening and morning, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the Lord of the Lord said, uh, came to him and saying, Arise, 
Can you give me a drink of water, Eli? Go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Okay, this is in Syria, right? Okay, where are we at here? Oh, wow. So he's down here being fed by the ravens, um, or possibly lower. Um, and he's told to go all the way up into, this is, a, this is Syria, right? Le Lebanon. But during that time, was it Syria or Assyria? Okay, this is Syria up here. He's told to go to a Gentile up into the Gentile area, and there's going to be a Gentile widow that takes care of him. Pretty amazing. Um, the Lord didn't send him to any of the widows of Israel, and that's actually talked about in the New Testament. I believe it's Jesus that talks about how Elijah was sent to a, uh, a Gentile, and, none of the, and he said there's, there was lots of widows in the land. Um, I actually didn't look that cross-reference up. Uh, okay, so we're going to find out that this guy led a, a pretty amazing life. Everywhere he goes, God's doing amazing things. So if it wasn't crazy enough to be fed by ravens, um, that always sounded fun, just hanging out at the brook, getting fed by the ravens, you know, taking a bath and getting a drink and just chillaxing there. Um, I doubt if he was chillaxing, he was probably pr praying because he was a man of prayer, fervent prayer, we're going to find out. So... He goes there, he goes right and goes to Zarephath, and it's kind of amazing. He arose and went, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, she immediately says, okay, I'm going to go get you some water. There was a drought there too. They were in a drought. She's going to go and give some of her water to him. He says to her, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Now, the, the damages of a drought are not only you don't have water, you don't have food. It's an agricultural um, society, and as much as we don't like it, we're an agricultural society. If we don't have water, we don't have food. It, it is required to grow food. He says, bring me a morsel of bread that you, to my bread in your hand. So she said, as the Lord our God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. So she recognized the Lord, uh, capital Lord there. So she's saying, as Yahweh, our God lives. So she must have been a believer in Yahweh. Um, she was at the end of it. <laughs> at least she understood it. She says, I don't have anything but a little bit of oil in a jar, and a little bit of flour in the bin. And she says, I'm gathering a couple sticks that we may go and prepare it for myself and my son, that we, excuse me, that we may eat and die. So she's like, this is our last meal. This is all the food we have. I'm a widow, and this is it. I have a little flour and a little oil. Now, you're not getting tasty meals with a little flour and a little oil. You take a little flour and you mix it up with a little oil and you mix up a little water and you have a little cake. So um, this is not a recipe for gourmet food. <laughs> um, Elijah says to her, do not fear. Imagine this. This widow is on the brink of starvation. This guy shows up and says, ah, give me all the food you, are, you have. And she says, oh, we're just about out. We're actually going to die. She, he says, oh, don't fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake. <laughs> Don't eat it yourself. Make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself, send your son. <laughs> this is in amazing, but it is a test for this woman, I believe, to see if she is going to believe in the Lord. Uh, it, it is always... It is hard to give when you have, it is, 
restart. <laughs> it is the widow's mite. This is the last thing that she has to give. And so is a real test of her faith, whether she's going to trust in the Lord. So, she's, so she says, go make for me the cake first, and then you can eat afterwards. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall a jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she can either have the temporary satisfaction of the flesh and be selfish, or she can have the permanent guarantee that God's going to take care of her all the way through the drought. Isn't that interesting? Um, so she goes and does it without questioning. At least it says she does. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her household ate for many days. Um, <laughs> in the Bible, many is italicized. So she ate for days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Okay, so that's pretty amazing, right? Fed by ravens, and then you're fed by a jar that um, is like Mary Poppins' hat or bag. Never runs out until the rain came. She was rewarded, and she was probably seeking the Lord. And the Lord listened and heard her and had mercy on her. It happened after this that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that he had no breath in him, left in him. So she said to Elijah, what have you done with, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? Isn't that interesting? She had done something in her past that she didn't like. And she's like, did you come to bring this to remembrance? And he said to her, give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on, one, laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, my God, have, also, you, have you also brought tragedy to this widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times. And cried out to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Three times. God, we're going to see Elijah's prayers are powerful because he prays earnestly. Not because the Lord just answers, but because he prays earnestly. Um, so the Lord comes back. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him to the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. <laughs> I like this verse. Then the woman said to Elijah, by, now by this, I know that you are a man of God. <laughs> the flour that never ran out and the oil that never ran out, I wasn't quite convinced. But when you raise my son from the dead, now I know you're a man of God. <laughs> and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. Okay, so kind of a funny ending there. Um, amazing story referred to in the New Testament. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, third year saying, go, so it's been three years of drought. Go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab and there was a severe famine in Samaria. Okay, so... Uh, so for, so it was while Jezebel, okay, sorry, I skipped a verse, verse three, and Ahab called to Obadiah, who was in charge of his house. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, and it goes on to say that when Jezebel was massacring the prophets of the Lord, he hid a hundred of them and hid them in two caves, uh, 50 of each, and watered and gave them bread. So he's taking care of the prophets of the Lord that Jezebel was massacring. And Ahab said to go, but I go into the land, all the springs of water, and to all the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass so we can keep the horse and mules alive so that we will not have to kill any stock. So they're at the point of killing their horses. Um, and he says, go search for water. And so they divided and uh, went to search for water, and verse 7, Obadiah was on his way when suddenly Elijah met him, and he recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is that you, my lord, Elijah? And he said, answered him, 
it is I. Go tell your master Elijah is here. <laughs> and Obadiah is like, huh? um, so he said to him, how have I sinned that you are delivering your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? <laughs> and I like what he says here. As the Lord God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to hunt for you. He's, Ahab has been hunting for Elijah. And when they said he is not there, he took an oath from the kingdom or the nations that they could not find you. Now you say, go tell your master Elijah's here. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from you, that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place I do not know. <laughs> He's like, God's going to protect you. We've been looking everywhere for you. We can't find you. When, you. when I go to Elijah, I mean to Ahab, that God's going to pick you up and put you somewhere else. And... <laughs> He's like, didn't you hear what I did? I hid, I hid a hundred of the prophets. I really love the Lord. Please don't kill me. Ah! And um, <laughs> Elijah said to the Lord, I mean, said to him, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely pre present myself to him today. So he's like, don't worry. You have the Lord's word on it. And that gives this man the courage to go tell him, and, Ahab, and then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Probably didn't say it quite like that. But he calls him the troubler of Israel. Uh, kind of interesting. And he said, I am not the troubler of Israel, but you and your father's house have in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. He says, I'm not the one that's causing this. You are. Many people think that the result of their sin, the, damaging, the damage of their sin to their lives is somehow God's fault or a righteous person in their life's fault. It's neither one of those things. It's their own sin. Ahab's own sin is because there's no rain on the land. If he would, we'll, we'll, we're going to see. If he repents, humbles himself, God will relent. Okay, so he says, Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me to Mount Carmel, and 450 prophets of Baal, and 400 prophets of Ash, Asher, Asherah, which is another, word for, another name for Ashtoreth, who eat at Jezebel's table. Jezebel literally has... 850 prophets of the wicked gods eating at a table. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel, and they met at Mount Carmel. And so we'll summarize here. Elijah says, you know, we're going to have a test. We're going to sacrifice a bull, each one of us. You guys go first. And we're going to see which God, calls to, which God comes down and consumes the fire, I mean consumes the bull with fire. Well, that seems like a good test. And he says, uh, you call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. That's a good test. So they meet at Mount Carmel. So Jezreel is where um, Ahab's palace was. Mount Carmel is near the coast of the Mediterranean. It's a high, it's, I think it's 1,500 feet. So you can see it. You can see the Mediterranean Sea from Mount Carmel. Well, not now because there's a bunch of houses on it. But you could see the Mediterranean Sea from Mount Carmel. And you can actually, Jay, can you see the Jordan River? Long, long ways. You, so that's facing the Jordan River, correct? Okay, so this is the top of Mount Carmel. You can see miles, this direction, miles. And you can see uh, all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. It's a place that we're going to find out was a favorite spot of worship because it was high. Um, and uh, it was a place where everybody could see what's going on. Everybody knew you can go to that mountain to worship. So... Uh, we're going to see that the Lord does not do this thing in a secret place. He picks the city on a hill, as it were. So the, pre, the Baal, uh, priests of Baal start dancing around, and they, they start at the morning. And So let's see. And they're uh, just crying out, crying out. 
and there was no voice. No one answered. They leaped about the altar, uh, which they had made. So they start, they start walking around, and they start running around, and now they're leaping around the altar. Ah, Baal, please, please, Baal! Just, just, idol worship is so... It's so obvious, but when you're in it, it's such a bondage. Because we do it. We do it. So it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry louder! Uh, for he is a God. He's like, but all is a God. He really is. Um, either he is meditating, or he's busy. Or he's on a journey. <laughs> he's like, maybe he's uh, taking a hike. Or perhaps he's sleeping, and you need to wake him up. Cry a little louder! It's just so funny. Um... So, <laughs> uh, actually, I won't go into that. Um, so he's like, oh, maybe he's meditating. Maybe he's busy. Perhaps he's on a journey. Maybe he's sleeping. Come on, louder. So they cried aloud. They listened. Baal, Baal. And uh, they cut themselves, as was their custom, listen to this, with knives and lances until the blood gushed out of them. That's disgusting. That is what idol worship will do to you. It'll make you do that. Yeah. Don't think that there's not a spirit behind cutting yourself. And when midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, all the way through the day. But there was no voice, no answer. Then Elijah said to the people, come near to me. And this is so cool. So cool. Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he prepared, he, he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Underline that and circle that in your Bible. Elijah repaired a broken down, dilapidated altar of God. That is cool. There was an altar on that mountain that was used to worship Yahweh, and it was broken down and, dis and dilapidated either by neglect or we're going to find out in the next chapter that Elijah says, they've killed all the prophets and torn down your altars. So this was either a broken down altar because of neglect or it was a broken down altar because the people tore it down. And Elijah repairs the broken altar. Isn't that cool? And he took 12, I don't have 12 fingers, 12 stones um, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, whom the Lord, the Lord said, came, said, saying, Israel shall be your name. Twelve stones. This was not, this, to me, this signifies that they were divinely divided as a nation, but they were not divinely divided spiritually. God was not, God did not intend Israel to divide from Judah religiously. He took 12 stones. He didn't take 10. He took 12. He said, you guys, you're still joined to them spiritually. 12 stones. Then the stones he built with the altar of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two sheaves of seed. And he put wood in the order, cut the bowl in pieces, and laid it on the wood. And he filled four water pots, and he said, fill four water pots, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice on the wood. They didn't do that with the other one. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. Now, water is valuable at this point. Remember, it hasn't rained for three years. So they're either hiking down to the Mediterranean Sea and getting water. Or it's their store of water that they brought with them to stay alive. So the water ran out. And it came to pass at the offering of the evening sacrifice that the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, the wood, 
and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Everything. Now, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Now, were they doing that out of repentance or fear? They were doing that out of fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But it needs to stay. It didn't stay. Um, they do it out of fear because they don't, re they, they just go right back to worshiping Baal. So Elijah seizes the moment. He says, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let them, one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Whew. Not a good day to be a prophet of Baal. Okay, it's never a good day to be a prophet of Baal. And Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. And Elijah, Ahab watched all this. He watched all this, guys. Just because somebody has a revelation from the Lord does not mean they're going to turn their heart to the Lord. Don't think that the, the more knowledge you have, then you're, you'll decide to follow God. So, he, so this is kind of cool. Another fervent prayer. And he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up, so he prays, he bowed, he, verse 42. Then he bowed down to the ground and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go up, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And seven times he said, go again. He prayed seven times earnestly to God for rain. It came to pass the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. So get to, they were probably near Mount Carmel, get to your house before you get stuck in your chariot. Uh, then it came to pass this, oh, sorry. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. <laughs> so Ahab takes off in his chariot and Ahab just gets the anointing. Of the Lord. He's like, God! girds up his loins, ties up his, that's, you know, ties up the, the dress that he was wearing and takes off and literally beats Ahab to Jezreel. He outruns the chariot. And we're, this is going to be important next chapter. He outruns the chariot. He's standing there, probably not even panting like, oh, hi. I mean, can you imagine Ahab's face as he's, uh, uh, <laughs> just um, uh, total work of the Lord to show Ahab that with God, all things are possible. But without God, your life is cursed. With God, all things are possible. Okay, so Jezebel has a little hissy fit because all of her favorite prophets are dead. I mean, you kill my prophets, man. Come on. Why'd you kill my prophets? So, she says, she, uh, Ahab goes in there and tells Jezebel, by the way, stay away from Jezebel, guys. Stay away from her. She may look good, but ugh, she is a nasty lady. So she sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me. And more also, if I do not make you, your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She says, she says, you're going to be dead by tomorrow, Elijah. The guy just got fed by ravens, stayed in the widow's house, prayed to the Lord, a young man was raised from the dead, called down fire, killed 850 prophets, and outran a chariot. Guess what, guys? You know what the cop car was? A chariot. They didn't have cop cars. They didn't have Dodge Chargers back then. They had chariots. Elijah can outrun a chariot. Do you think Jezebel can catch him? No. But what does he do? But he himself went, uh, okay. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. Probably not as fast. He's like, man, what happened? I'm a lot slower now. And went to 
uh, Jersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. So he's up here at Jezreel, and he goes to, oh, uh, where are we at, Jay? Down. Oh, my goodness. Wow. That is a long ways. 40 miles, probably. Um, leaves his servant there, goes into the wilderness, and uh, is just depressed. And this is a really good chapter if you want to have some wisdom on helping somebody that's depressed, depending on why they are depressed. De Elijah's depressed because instead of a revival, he's getting threats to his life. And he's moved his eyes from the Lord to the people that aren't responding around him. Um, and so let's see what we can learn here. Okay, so he went into a, a day's journey and he says, It is enough! Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Um, he prayed that he might die. Then he laid and slept under a broom tree. So he like just passes out under a broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Guys, the very first angel food cake. <laughs> if somebody's depressed, give them angel food cake. No. <laughs> although, no all that, although that might work on me. I don't know. So he um, says, rise and eat. So what do we have here? We have sleep. We have food and water. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him. He fell asleep again and said, Rise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he rose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb to the mountain of God. So he takes off south. Do we have that on Jer here, Jay? Uh, Mount Sinai? Oh, here we go. So he takes off and he goes 40 days on no food to Mount Sinai, which is way south. Um, and he enters the cave there. Um, by the way, if an angel appears to you and there's angel food cake, you'd think that'd be enough to shake somebody out of their depression. But he's really rooted in this and he's really, we're going to find out that he's a little so focused. But I mean, he's, he, he prophesied and nobody, nobody's heart turned, which is very, very depressing. So he goes into a cave. <laughs> he gets to the mountain. The first thing is like, where's a good hey, cave I can hide in? <laughs> I just want to go into a cave and die. And the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> He's like, uh, what are you in the cave for? Um, and he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, which is true. For the children of Israel have forsaken your commandments, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. And he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountain and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And afterward, after the wind and the earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in a fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in a mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? Same question. Why are you depressed, Elijah? Why are you depressed? God's being so gentle with him. Why did he show the wind and the earthquake and the fire and then the still small voice. Why, why did you guys think he did that? God wasn't in the big, powerful, amazing, frightening things. God was in the still small voice. I think he was reminding Elijah that God is right there. God is right there. You don't have to have a powerful, big, boom, fire come down 
for God to be with you? I don't know. That's up to personal interpretation. Okay, so he says the same exact thing, word for word. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your commandments, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets. With the sword, I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Still, the Lord's like, okay, come on, learn your lesson. Then the Lord said to him, go return to your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. And you shall anoint Yehu, the son of Nishma, as king over Israel, and Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Meholah, who shall anoint, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. So he gives him food, he gives him water, he gives him rest, he gives him exercise, he has to hike to the mountain, and then he gives him a task. When somebody is in the and depressed because their ministry is failing or God didn't work the way they wanted to or they're just burnt out because they've been off the mission field. Remember that. Food, rest, exercise. Now, let's go do something for the Lord. We still have work to do. It shall be whoever escapes, I love this, the sword of Hazel, Je Yehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Yehu, Elijah will kill. Yet, Elijah, you're not alone. It's not you, and it's not all about you. I have reserved 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not bowed to the ball, and every mouth that has not kissed him. There's still a remnant. Don't think you're the only one that's worshiping Yahweh. So he goes. Let's see here. He goes, and we are in chapter... Oh, we can't miss Elijah. So he calls Elijah. Elijah's pulling with 12, I believe. Yeah, 12 yoke of oxen. That's a lot. That's a serious plow. 12 cows pulling it. That was a John Deere plow. Big one. Um, and <laughs> that's not going to translate very well. <laughs> um, big plow. 12 cows. Big, big. <laughs> okay, so, he's, so Elijah comes and passes by and throws his mantle on him, which is a signet of, you're going to take over my ministry. And Elijah left the oxen and ran to Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elijah turns back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh, used the oxen as equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. His very first thing is going into ministry is blessing other people. Takes his earthly possessions, 12 cows and a plow and yokes was very, very valuable at that time. Very valuable. And he takes it, burns it, gives it away. That's a lot. He was a busy guy cut up 12 cows and fed it to people. That's, they, were, they were tough back then. And he rose and followed Elijah. And he doesn't say he kissed his mom and dad, but I'm hoping he did. Because that's what good sons should do. <laughs> now, Ben had had... Um, so, interesting. Elijah doesn't rebuke him for going back and giving what he has to the poor and saying goodbye to his parents. Um, but he had no reserves. He was ready to follow Elijah. He was, okay, Let's do it. His heart was already on the Lord. Okay, so chapter 20, I'm going to try to summarize quickly. Um, Ben-Hadad um, was the king of Syria, and he's about to go to war with Assyria. Uh, with, let, me, let me see here. I think it was Assyria. Uh, 32 kings were with him, and he rose to Jerusalem and went, besieged Samaria. Samaria, and said uh, into war against it. And ben had comes to the, and sends a messenger to Ahab and says, your silver and your gold are mine and your lovely wives and your children are mine. Basically saying, I want all your stuff. All your good stuff, I want. 
Now, I couldn't find, maybe it's in 2 Kings, I couldn't find, but it seems like there was one time where the king of Israel was bound to do what he said, and it was probably during the drought because they didn't, like, they were destitute. And so the king sends a messenger back saying, Indeed, I have sent to you, saying, You shall deliver me to your silver and your gold and your wives and your children, but I will send my servant to you tomorrow about this time, and they shall search your house. So this, sorry, this is not been the Ahab has been out been Hadad, and the houses of your servants, and it shall be that whatever is pleasant in your eyes, they will put in their hands and take it. The king, <laughs> this guy's just like, so so J. Samaria is not Israel. That's a separate. Okay, so he's going to fight a different king, and he's like, I gotta go fight this king. I need some supplies and some more wives. And so he's like, I'm going to send some servants and they're going to take anything that looks good. They're going to go through your garage and if you've got a nice golf set, they're just going to snag that and, you know, your hot rod, car, and um, all that stuff. <laughs> i got to stop using these idioms. <laughs> and um, so the king said, tell the Lord of the king, all that you send your servant the first time, I will do, but this I cannot do. And the message came back. And ben had said, The gods do, do so to me, and more also, if enough dust is left in Samaria for a handful for each of the people who follow me. So he's like, I'm bringing so many people that there won't even be enough for a handful of your dirt for my guys to carry home. He's like, I am bringing a herd. So we're going to find out he does. <laughs> I like what the king of Israel says. Let not the one, he sends a message back and he says, let not the one who puts on his armor boast like the one who takes it off. Don't brag about your achievements before they're achieved. And that's a lesson we can all learn of. Don't be like, oh my goodness, I'm about to do something amazing. Ah, oh, didn't quite happen. Which Ben Hadad finds out. So Ben Hadad's like, let's get ready by drinking. <laughs> They get all their sources, sources and forces, all the sources and forces together, and they get ready and to get ready to attack the city. But, you know, you've got to have a drunken party first. Uh, suddenly a prophet approached Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus says the Lord, have you seen all the great multitude? Behold, I will deliver them in your hand. And he says, oh, how are you going to deliver them? And he says, by the young, the prophet says, by the young leaders, not by you old wise people, by the young leaders. Why would God have the young leaders be the ones that led them into the, into the battle? Any, any ideas? Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The young warriors were not, they didn't know how to fight. They didn't have the battle knowledge, the experience of fighting. And he says, no, all of the captains, they step back. The young guys, they're going to lead the army because it has to be known that I am the one that brings this victory. So they mustered the young leaders to the province and there were 232. And they mustered all the people and there were 7,000. This guy has 32 kings following him. We're going to find out that they were like a little flock of goats surrounded by a, a whole valley full. Um, and so they went out and uh, somebody says uh, to Ben-Hadad, men are coming out of Samaria. They're coming out to fight. And he said, if they have come out for peace, take them alive. If they have come out to f for war, take them alive. Doesn't that sound like a drunk guy? It's like, if they come out for peace, take them alive. If they come out to fight, take them alive. Just don't drink. And each one kill his man. So the Samaria, and each one killed his own man. So the Syrians fled and Israel pursued them and ben had the king escaped on horse with the cavalry. Then the king of Israel went out and attacked the horses and chariots and killed Syrians with a great, the Syrians with a great slaughter. So the prophet of the Lord comes back and says, uh, get ready because uh, the Syrians are coming back. And I love this. The servants of the king of Syria said to him, oh, their gods are the gods of the hills. Therefore, they were strong there. But if we fight again in the plains, 
we can surely we will be stronger than them. Their gods are hill gods. They don't know how to go to the plains, so we need to fight in the plains. What kind of logic is that? Yeah, they're still drinking. Like, oh, they're, they're in the mountains. We need to. And you shall muster an army like the army that you had lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariots. chariot. Then they will fight against them in the plains. Surely we will be stronger than they. And he listened to the voice and did so. Um, and so I like this verse. The children of Israel get ready. Um, Da, 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 da. Okay, verse 29. And they encamped opposite each other for seven days. You know, kind of checking each other out. So it was on the seventh day. Oh, I missed that part. I, where was that at? Okay, yeah, 27. And the children of Israel were mustered and given provisions, and they went against them. Now the children of Israel encamped before them like two little flocks of goats. While the Syrians filled the countryside. They got two little flocks of goats. <laughs> this is just awesome. Only in a Semitic uh, culture would you describe it. Oh, they're just two little flocks of goats. Um, and the, the, the Lord said, Because the children of, of Syria, because Syria has said, The Lord is the God of the hills, but he is not the God of the valleys. Therefore, I will deliver all the great multitude into your hand. So they... Fight them. They kill 20. Uh, let's see. They kill 100,000 foot soldiers. Well, how much did they have before? 7,000 people. They kill 100,000 foot soldiers. That is more than 10 persons per person. They killed more than 10 people per person. And then the Lord does some killing here. But the rest fled to Apek, into the city. Then a wall fell on, 27,000 of the men who fled. They're like hiding behind the wall. <laughs> 27,000 guys die from a wall falling on them. The Lord was doing a great work. Okay, so the, here's the sin. The king runs away and he's like, oh, Ben-Hadad's like, Oh, oh, please, please have mercy on me. Please, please. And Ahab says, Oh, you're my brother. And Ben-Hadad says, uh, Oh, the cities that we took from you, and I'm going to give them back. Like, he's in a position to give back cities. You know, he's just like really uh, playing up to, to Ahab here. Now, Ahab was not supposed to do that. Now, why would Ahab keep the king alive? Why would he keep the king alive? You have any ideas? Maybe one of those cities. Maybe one of those cities? I think part of the reason was bragging rights. If you kill everybody, you don't have anybody to have authority over. But if you leave the king alive, you can hold that over top of him and play him like one of your pawns in your scheme. So this is the battlefield here. Um, okay, Ben Hadad's battles with Israel at Apak. Ben Hadad battles with Israel and Judah at Ramoth Gilead. Okay, so we have the first battle here in the mountains, right? And then the second battle here. And uh, they're coming up from Damascus. They're, fought, they're coming quite a ways to fight. And uh, then the last one, Ben-Hadad besieges Samaria. Oh, that's later on. That is later on. So, this guy was supposed to kill the king and everybody, and he doesn't. He keeps the king alive. So, now a certain man of the sons of the prophets said to his neighbor, by the word of the Lord, Strike me, please. This is kind of a weird story. There's a prophet who's standing next, you know, can you imagine your buddy standing next to you? Stab me with a knife. I'm not going to stab you with a knife. <laughs> and he said to him, because you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, surely as soon as you depart from me, a lion shall kill you. And as soon as he left, a lion found him and killed him. 
And he found another man <laughs> and said, strike me, please. You know, he's like, strike me. No. You're going to be eaten by a lion. Ah! Strike me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he strikes him. And uh, so he's got a wound. Um, <laughs> this guy's like, okay, I don't want to get eaten by a lion. And the prophet departed and waited for the king by the road and disguised himself with a bandage over his eyes. So he looks like one of the wounded soldiers of the army. And, he's, and it, the king came by and he said, your servant went out into the midst of the battle, and there a man came over and brought a man to me and said, Guard this man. By any means he, by, if by any means he is missing, your life shall be for his life, or else you shall pay a talent of silver. So I'm wounded. Somebody put me a, a guard over me. At least this is my understanding of it. I could be wrong. Somebody put a guard a, a, over me, and I and, and that guy took off. The guard took off. He wasn't supposed to. He was supposed to guard me, and the, uh, he's like, "What should we do, King?" And the king says, "Your you shall, you so shall your judgment be. You yourself have decided it." Um, I read that three or four times, Jay, and I was trying to get what it meant. Am I right in my interpretation? Okay, um, and. So the king says, oh, that guy, he needs to die or pay a talent of silver. And the guy pulls his veil off of his eyes, and the king recognized him as one of the prophets. And he said, thus says the Lord, because you have let slide out of your hand a man who I had pointed to utterly destruct, for utter destruction, therefore your life shall go for his life and your people for his people. So the king of Israel went to his house, sullen, sullen, and displeased, and came to Samaria, not repenting, not asking God for forgiveness, not glorifying God for the great victory. <laughs> Solon. Okay, next chapter 21, murder of Naboth. Okay, so we are running out of time, so I'm going to through this chapter. Naboth has a garden. It's next to the... the um, uh, Naboth has a garden. It's next to the uh, king's palace. And Ahab wants it. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, house, don uh, oxen, field. I remember that somewhere. Wasn't that in what, some commandments somewhere? Um, and Nab and Abel, Abel, Ahab goes to him and says, man... Um, give me your vineyard and I will get, he says, give me your vineyard and I'm going to give you another one or I'll give you money, either one. And the man says, rightly so. Nabal says, Nabal says, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. He says, my fathers, this is my father's land that was given to me when we entered the land. I'm not going to give it to you. So Ahab went to the house, sullen. He was a sullen guy. Displeased because of the words of Naboth and Je Jezre of Jezreel had spoken to him. Um, so Jezebel, his wife, comes to him and says, Oh, honey, why are you so sad? Why is your spirit so sullen that you do not eat food? He's, so, he's like, well, I'm not going to eat any food because I don't get the garden. Um, so... <laughs> He said to her, because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and he said to me, give me your vineyard. And I said to him, give me your vineyard for money. And he s tells him the story, and he would not give it to me. <laughs> so I'm going to hold my breath. <laughs> and Jezebel, his wife, said, oh, you now exercise this authority over Israel. You're the king. Arise, eat food, and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, of the Jezreelite. Um, and so she schemes this plan. She invites Naboth to a party. I mean, she writes a letter to the city's uh, leaders. And he sa they say, invite Naboth and appoint two scoundrels uh, to say that he blasphemed God um, and the king. So, and, so 
Invite him to a party. Make him the head person. And then get two witnesses that are going to lie and say he blasphemed God and the king and then stone him to death. And what I wrote down is when wicked people invite you to a party and say, we're going to give you the best seat in the house so we can throw stones at you. Don't go. There's some proverbs about not hanging out with the wicked people and not eating specifically with the wicked people and not taking what they say. Oh, you can have it. You can have the best seat in the house while they stab you in the back. So learn from Nabal and don't go to the wicked parties, even if they say, oh, we're going to give you the best seat. He dies and the king and the word gets back to Jezebel. Then Jezebel, then they sent to Jezebel saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. And it was, and it came to pass when Jezebel, verse 15, heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, arise, take the possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money. For Naboth is now, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. So it was when Ahab heard that Naboth was, hap was dead. Oh, yay! I get my vineyard! Ahab got up, went down to take possession of the vineyard. He's happy now. Oh, I get my vineyard. Naboth died. I don't want to know how Naboth died. He probably died of, you know, an aneurysm or a heart attack or something. I don't want to know how I died. I just want the vineyard. There is a... Um, a verse that we need to put in our cross-reference here, because some people wonder why Ahab was judged for Jezebel's sin. It is Numbers 33, Numbers chapter 30, verse 3. Ahab was responsible for Naboth's death. If a wife takes an oath or a, or a um, daughter takes an oath and a husband finds out about it, then he, if he doesn't do anything about it, he becomes responsible to, to that oath. He cannot break that oath. And the, the concept of it is if you're in ignorance, you're not responsible. But as soon as you become knowledgeable of what your wife or your daughter did, you have now a decision to make. And he had a decision when he found out that Naboth was dead. Remember, Jezebel said, I'm going to get you the garden. And she comes back, you know, two days later and says, Naboth's dead. It's your garden now. He doesn't question it at all. He just goes down out of his greed. So he heads down and a prophet meets him. Uh... Uh, he sends Elijah. He sends Elijah. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, Go down and meet Ahab of, I the, of Israel who lives in Samaria. Uh, he is going to take the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. So he meets him and he says, Because you did this wickedness, your blood is going to be licked up the same place Naboth's blood was, because you desired his vineyard. So Ahab cries, and he actually tears his clothes, puts sackcloth and ashes on, and covers himself with ashes. And the Lord has mercy on him. The Lord says, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. Because he humbled himself in the sight of the Lord, the destruction of his house didn't happen until after his death which I, the Lord is plentiful in mercy to this wicked king. Okay, so chapter 22 is the last chapter. And I think we have time to read through it really quick. Now three years had passed without war between Syria and Israel. Then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to his servant, Do you now... Do you know that Ramoth and Gilead is ours? But we hesitate to take it from the hand of Syria. 
Let's go get Ramoth of Gilead. It's both of ours. We both own it. So he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king, I am as you are. My people are as your people. My horses are as your horses. And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Good decision. Let's find out what God has to say about it. Before you make a decision to yoke yourself with the world, that is what Jehoshaphat is doing here. He's going to yoke himself to Ahab, the wicked king that's going to, that has been sacrificing to Baal. Let's see. To, uh, sacrificing to Baal, sacrificing to Ashtoreth, sacrificing to Molech. Has had the word of the Lord come to him many times and he's never repented. Before you yoke yourself, find out what the Lord has to say. And then obey the voice of the Lord. Don't just say, oh, that probably wasn't from God. Or, oh, I'll be fine. I'll be fine if I go in and join with the world. And I'm, I'm going to be fine. We can, we can get through this. Learn from Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men. Where have we seen that number before? <laughs> have we seen 400 prophets before? They weren't prophets of the Lord. <laughs> And said to them, <laughs> I mean, can you, okay, you guys aren't prophets of Baal. You're prophets of the Lord. You aren't prophets of Baal. You're prophets of the Lord. <laughs> As they're going out, not Baal, the Lord. Not Baal, the Lord. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'll remember. <laughs> and Jehoshaphat, okay, so they said, 400 guys all came out. And, and the king said, shall I go up to Ramoth Gilead to fight? Or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into your hand, O oh, of the king, in the hand of the king. Now remember, the last two battles that they had, they went out with a one tenth, less than a tenth, and defeated them. So they had that happen twice. They're thinking they can do it again. Um, because remember what the word of the Lord was last time. The word of the Lord was go out, because I have delivered him in your hand. So they're just copying. They're just copy and pasting. <laughs> and Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here? That we may inquire of him? <laughs> He's, he recognizes um, uh, your name tag is showing a little bit. It says Baal. I know the rest of that word. You're a prophet of Baal. You're not a prophet of Yahweh. <laughs> oh, I forgot to take that name tag off. So, um, the king of Israel <laughs> said to Jehoshaphat, there's still one. He doesn't mention Elijah. There's still one, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him. This guy is like a three-year-old because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. <laughs> this guy doesn't say anything nice about me. Just bad, bad, bad. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such things. Don't say that stuff about the prophet of the Lord. That's not good to say about the preacher. And, I mean, that's righteous. Don't talk about that about the preacher. The king of Israel, uh, so then the king of Israel called an officer and said, bring Micaiah, the son of Imlah, quickly. And the king of Israel and, Jehosh and, Jehosh and Jehoshaphat, man, the king of Judah, having put on the robes, sat each on his throne at the threshing floor of the entrance of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before him. They're just dancing around prophesying. So Zedekiah, the son of Shenaniah, <laughs> just get this, guys, made horns out of iron for himself, and he said, Thus says the Lord, With these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. He puts horns on his head. He's like, You're going to gore the Syrians just like this. Just... They're, they're being very foolish. False prophecy often is linked with, with foolish actions. Link, put that in your head. False prophecy is often linked with foolish actions. Not that, the, not that the Lord doesn't ask the prophets to do some crazy things, but these guys are doing it as eye service. They are wanting to look good and look all dancing and jumping around and making horns and they were probably singing it. And Okay, the messenger who had gone to Micaiah spoke to him saying, now listen, the word of the prophets with one accord 
encourages the king, please, please, let the word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. Can you say something nice about us one time, please? <laughs> I love when Micaiah says, as the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. Let that be our genre. Let that be our life. Doesn't matter what the world has to say, what God says is important. Doesn't matter if all of the people, all of the preachers are saying, homosexuality is all right. God says homosexuality is all right. God says pornography is all right. God says getting drunk is all right. Don't go along with the world. As the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says, that I will speak. Let that be your life. Then he came to the king, and the king said to, Micah, said to him, Micaiah, shall we go out to war at Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? And he said to him, Go and prosper, for the Lord will deliver you into the hand of the king. I bet he said it just like that, because what's the response? So the king said to him, How many times, how many times shall I make you swear that you will tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? <laughs> <laughs> How many times? You could just see his veins popping. and <laughs> Jehoshaphat's probably holding his robe. No, no, no. Then he said, I saw Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that had no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me? But evil. <laughs> this guy is just cracking me up. This guy doesn't say anything nice. There are people that I have heard say that about preachers. He never has anything nice to say about me. It's always bad, 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 bad. Can he think of anything nice to say about me? <laughs> and Mik Mik this is interesting. Micaiah says, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. This is cool. This guy sees a vision. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him. Ahab thinks that God's not paying attention. God is paying attention. So one of, uh, and the Lord said, who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? It was God's plan. So one of the one spoke in this manner and the other spoke in that manner. So they're bringing their their theories before God. Now, I don't. It seems like this is actually what happened. I don't know. And the spirit came came forward and stood before the Lord and said, "I will persuade him." How does he persuade him? The Lord said to him, "In what way?" So he said, "I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets." And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. So go and do so. God is telling Ahab exactly what happened. Exactly. Ahab, I believe, is in that point in the scriptures that talks about how you can't know the truth. Ahab cannot know the truth at this point. The truth is told to him so clearly it's a deceiving and lying spirit. Because Ahab knows that Micaiah is a true prophet. And therefore, therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. And you remember the guy with the horns? Zedekiah, the son of Nick, uh, Kenaniah, went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way did the spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you? So he's basically saying, you're the false prophet, not me. And Micaiah said, indeed, you shall see what Micaiah, and Micaiah said, indeed, you shall see on the day when you go into the inner chamber to hide. You're going to be hiding for your life. So the king of Israel said, take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city of jo Joash, the king's son, and say, thus says the king, put this fellow in prison and feed him with the bread of affliction and the water of affliction until I come in peace. But Micaiah said, if you ever in return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, take heed, all you people. So the, the, pro the 
prophet turns away from the king and he looks to the people. He says, listen to what I just said. You guys are marching to your death. God makes it very clear. Okay, so Israel comes into battle. Don't yoke yourself with the world because you lose your wisdom. You lose the ability to make clear decisions. Does it sound good right after you heard a prophecy that the king is going to die to dress up like the king? That's what Ahab does. Ahab's like, uh, Jehoshaphat, you know, uh, you should really be the king. Uh, you know that prophecy? Well, let's not talk about the prophecy. You should really be the king. How about you get dressed up and I'll just look like a soldier because, you know, you're more kingly than I am. I mean, you got two tribes. I only have ten. <laughs> and so literally, Jehoshaphat does this. Why in the world does Jehoshaphat do this? One step of compromise leads to another, and pretty soon you don't know you don't know that you're making stupid decisions. You, you, you wake up and you're like, that was really dumb. Why did I do this? Well, because you're hanging out with the world. You yoke yourself to the world. You do the things that the world tells you to do. Don't yoke yourself with the world. Yoke yourself to the Lord. Take my burden upon you, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Learn from me. Okay, I need to get going here. I'm just having way too much fun. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go in battle, but you put on your robes. So the king did so. So the king of Assyria said, command of 32 captains of his chariot, saying, fight with no one, small or great, but only the king of Israel. So it was when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat that they said, surely this is the king of Israel. <laughs> they see Jehoshaphat and it worked. Ahab's plan worked. They aren't attacking him. They're attacking Jehoshaphat. Therefore, they turned aside to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. <laughs> ah! And it happened when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. Now a certain man drew a bow at random. He's just sitting there. He's like, oh, literally, he just drew, drew the bow at random. He's like, I wonder what this thing does. Ding. Oh, <laughs> it's just crazy. The Lord, nothing is going to stop the Lord. <laughs> and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. Now, armor overlays each other, right? You, you, so so a, a joint like this, a attack like this, wouldn't work. But something coming uh, would. It struck him between the joints of his armor. He thought that he was going to be sneaky. He thought that doing sin, as long as I'm doing it in the dark, as long as I have made insurance, I'm, I'm going to be fine. He thought that, oh, I'm going to sin and I'm going to do it over here where nobody can see. Or I'm going to um, leave my, I'm not going to tell people my real name. I'm going to tell them a fake name. I'm going to go sin and tell them a fake name. Or I'm going to, I'm going to, I have a better idea. I'm going to go to a city far away from where I live so nobody knows that it's me. Doesn't that sound what we do? What we do, what goes through our head? It's not going to work, guys. It is not going to work because somebody's going to draw a bullet random and and you're going to be struck. You're going to be in that city and... <laughs> oh! Theron! I haven't seen you in a long time. I just moved here. Oh. I mean, it's, it's not going to happen. You're not going to escape the Lord. Turn around and take me off the battle, for I'm wounded. The battle increased that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot, facing the Syrians, and died at evening. The blood ran out from the wound on the floor of the chariot. Then at sundown... When sun had gone down, the shout went out throughout the army, saying, Every man to his city and every man to his country. Exactly like the king said. I mean, like the prophet said. They were scattered with like sheep without a shepherd. And the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried him in Samaria. Then someone washed the chariot 
at the pool of Samaria. And the dogs licked up the blood while the chariot bathed, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken. Now the wrecks of the acts of Ahab, all, all that he did, the ivory house that he built, is all in the book. So Jehoshaphat, we're going to end with him. Jehoshaphat ruled over Judah. He was Asa's son. Remember who Asa was, guys? Asa was a good king. We finally have a good king that begot a good king. Yes! Asa trained his child up. He was Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat was a good king. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he became king, and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azuba, and the daughter of Shilei. And he walked in all the ways of his father Asa. He did not turn aside from... The, from them, doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for the people offered sacrifices and burnt incense on the high places. Also Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, all that he had, the might that he showed and how he made war, that are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the King? And the rest of the perverted people, remember who those guys are? Male prostitutes. The rest of the male prostitutes who remained in the days of his father Asa, he banished from the land. There was, n there, uh, there was no king in Edom, only a deputy of the king. Now Jehoshaphat, he tries it again. He tries to unite with the world one more time. He makes a deal with Ahab's son, uh, Asahah, Ahiza. And he's, he's like, okay, we're going to make out this bargain. It's, it's, it's not to fight Samaria. It's to bring in merchant stuff. And so we're going we're gonna to build some ships together and we're going to reunite and we're stronger together, right? We're, we're more, we can do more for the Lord if we have more money. We can do more for the Lord if we work with the ungodly. We can do more for the Lord if we just compromise in this one area. You know, I'm just going to compromise in this. I'm going to cheat I'm going to cheat on this person just a little bit so I can have a little more money and then I can do more for the Lord. God sends a storm and he made merchant ships to go to Arp Opar for gold. God sends a storm and wrecks all of his boats. Then Ahaza, the son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, let my servant go with your servant in the ships. But Jehoshaphat would not. Now, the reason that I read this is because it's not shown in this passage, but it is in Chronicles 20, 37. The ships were destroyed. A prophet was sent to him, and the ships were destroyed because he built them in unison with Ahasa. Ahasa, the son of Ahab, became king of Israel. He reigned in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat and reigned two years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father. He was a wicked king. Um, and he worshiped the balls. He was a bad guy. So, we're not done with Elijah yet. But what can we learn from Elijah? Was he a man of God? Did he do amazing things for God? He did amazing things for God. Did he struggle in his walk? He struggled. He was still a man. He had depression. He became self-focused. It reminded me of Peter walking on the water, looking at Jesus walking on the water. And all of a sudden, he looks around at the storm, takes his eyes off of Christ, looks around at the world, looks around and sees Jezebel trying to kill him, looks around and sees nobody is following the Lord with him, and he sinks. And the Lord comes and picks him up, sets him back in the boat, and gives him something to do. Another thing that we can learn from Elijah, he's coming back. The Lord says that he's going to come back um, and uh, turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And John the Baptist was a type of Elijah, but there's another Elijah coming. What an honor. What an honor he had to be to have the right to come back at the very end to be the last evangelist. He never got to see the revival, but he's going to be the last evangelist. 
Another thing, um, James 5, 13 through 18. Flip to that. Remember, he didn't pray and just God answered like that. How many times did he have to pray for the boy? No, three. How many times did he, earnestly, how many times did he have to pray for rain? Seven times. James 5, 13 through 18. If anyone among you is suffering, let him pray. If anyone cheerful, let him sing psalms. If anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of, the, of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We've heard that, right? We've all quoted it. What's the next verse? Elijah was a man with the nature like ours. Elijah was not a superhuman. He was just a man. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens rain, gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Elijah prayed earnestly and was able to stop rain from falling. He wasn't. God answered his prayer to stop rain from falling on the earth. Elijah's ministry required earnest prayer. And our ministry requires earnest prayer. Not, oh Lord, by the way, okay, I'm on my way. Earnest prayer. Elijah knew that the fervent pr prayer of a righteous man avails much. What would be the opposite of that? What's the opposite of what Elijah did? What's the opposite of a fervent prayer? And it's unfervent prayer. The opposite of a fervent prayer would be an unfervent prayer. What's an unfervent prayer? Hasty, Hasty without heart, not really trusting that the Lord can do anything about it. You know, maybe it's a, just a good luck charm or a lucky r foot rabbit. Let's not be that. Let's, when we, when the, God has asked us to do something, or we have to make decisions in our lives, or we have, or we have, or God has called us to pray for somebody or something. God told Elijah to pray that and then didn't allow it to happen until he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. He sent his servant seven times up onto the mountain. And we're going to find out a little later on that there's a little test for, the, for somebody uh, to go dip in the river seven times. Um, the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And I want to be like Elijah. I want to be the man that God can count on praying fervently. Not unfervently, because God wants us to pray fervently. God wants us to trust in him. God wants us to pray fervently. So that wraps up 1 Kings. Rise and fall of Solomon uh, and divided kingdom. Uh, I really enjoyed it, guys. I really, really enjoyed Elijah. I hope you guys got some little nuggets out of there that he rebuilt an altar of the Lord. He didn't make a new one. He didn't make a new God. He restored the old worship. Uh, key verse, 1 Kings 9, 3 through 7, 1 through 11, rise and fall of Solomon, 12 through 21, divided kingdoms. Okay, next week, 2 Kings. Thank you guys so much for coming and thank you for listening and thanks for enduring um, my humor. <laughs> See you guys later.